Hi, here I've got the Modway from Korg. Now this has been out for over 12 months now, so I'm a little bit late in the day for a review. So you've probably seen plenty of videos, all the ones I've seen explaining what it is, what it does, how it works, read all the reviews of it. But when I got my hands on it, and I've been looking forward to getting my hands on it, because I do like a wavetable synth. I'm a big fan of the microwaves, for example. Uh, it wasn't what I was expecting. And I'm not sure if that's because other people missed stuff on the reviews, or if they just demoed things that I wasn't concentrating on, or whether I just didn't watch the videos properly. But it was a completely different synth to what I was expecting. So I thought what I could do is almost a review of the reviews and show you why it's different to what you might expect having watched everything I've already watched. So just a big thanks to Perfect Circuit for sponsoring this video. Uh, it's not often I get sponsored, so it's nice for that to happen. I'll say a little bit more about them later. But first, let's, uh, let's just jump straight in. The very first thing I noticed when I started playing with it, it's not a DW8000 version 2 or version 3. It's just so much more than that. I did wonder why there was the D and the W in different colours, and that's because a little bit of the hype around it has been about it being based on the legacy of the DW8000. And that's just completely and utterly selling this synth short because um, the DW8000 was so basic. And if you want to know what a DW8000 was like, there's this free soft synth from Full Bucket called the FB7999. And this is an emulation of the DW8000 and the 6000. It's got a couple of different modes here. And you'll notice across here we've got 16 waveforms. And they're the 16 waveforms that you get on the DW8000. And that's it. On the DW6000, you only get eight. But on this, you get absolutely <laughs> thousands of them. So if we go in to the wave select, let's go to sample, because they're the single waveforms. And if we just go through what we've got here, you can see there's absolutely hundreds of them. Some of them are one shots, and there's whole drum kits and special effects and stuff in here. J. <laughs> and as I say, there's literally hundreds of those, so it could be here all day. But we've also got ones that loop. They're just basic waveforms, but we've got much more complex ones as well. And here I'm literally just going randomly through them. You're watching me sort of do this live, as it were. I'm not trying to pick out the best ones, I'm just flicking through it. There's so many good starting points, it's really easy to make really nice sounds. Now, I did a, a little version of Robert Miles' Children from a clubbing TV show, and that needs a piano, so I tried the piano sounds, just went straight to a piano sample in here. There we go. And there are different samples in there at different velocities, so. as well as an M1. Sounds a bit rubbish, let's put a bit of release on that. Instant M1 piano, it's like two moves from an initial patch. Let's go back to the acoustic ones. And that's super simple, just using one of the samples. We've got two oscillators per layer. We've got two layers, so we could use four of those samples in there. What have we got? We've got MP, is that Meta Piano? Hit hard. And we've got hit very hard. Not a lot of difference there, but you can hear it. 
But that means with those three samples, you could put different velocity layers in, for example, if you want to go a little bit deeper. I haven't. <laughs> And just a quick FYI, this is my arrangement of Robert Miles' Children, all made on the mod wave. Everything except for the drums that are down here in, in pink is the mod wave. And that includes all the effects and the, well, slightly rubbish thunder. But stuff like the guitars, We're like a, about three steps from an initial patch, as, a, as the piano was that I just showed. And the sonar uses two layers. It's got like a sonar sound and a string underneath. So all in all, I was absolutely amazed when I did this. It only took a couple of hours to do the whole thing. Let me just take the drums out. The whole thing's only a couple of minutes long, but I'll put a link in the description. I've got a YouTube short with it on and an Instagram post with it, but uh, I'm not putting the whole thing on this because I keep on getting hammered by copyright, maybe rightfully so in this case. But there's also so many other little things in this that just takes it away from being a DW8000. For example, the motion sequencer, let's just load up um, something, shall we? And if you're interested in this synth, you probably already know what the motion sequencer does. But I'm just sort of throwing this in at the intro, really, to show you how vastly different it is to the DW8000. I'll look a little bit deeper into that in a little bit, but then we've got things like the chaos pad as well. So there's just so much more in there. So we've got two oscillators, we've got two layers. Each of those oscillators can blend between two different waves. We've got four envelopes, we've got, is it five LFOs? We've got effects. If we take a look at the, at the app, it's much easier to see all these things on the app, actually. We've got pre-effects, and these are compressors. So these are before the effects, really. A decimator, EQs, parametric EQs, ring mod, tremolos. Shapers, and we've got mod effects like phases and chorus. Again, these are all presets. You can just load them in or you can go and tweak them yourself. Have a look at these. Lots of different parameters you can tweak in the app. There's more parameters actually in the app than there are on the synth itself. So you've got delays and then a master reverb. And the master reverb and this EQ um, are blended after layer one or layer A and layer B. So with all that control in there, you can even modulate the modulators. Uh, it's just such a vastly superior synth in every way than the DW8000. You can just see here, it's such a limited thing. Two oscillators, two envelope generators, a single LFO and a digital delay. Although the original did obviously have analog filters, which I suppose is a bonus compared to these. It depends if you like uh, analog filters uh, or you'd rather have the flexibility of having a Poly 6, MS20, uh, bandpass and notches and all sorts of different things and blends between different filter types that you can have on this. This doesn't have the ADSSR envelopes you get in a DW8000. So if you think you're going to be able to take a patch from a DW8000 and replicate it on this, it's going to be very difficult. So a comparison of this and that synth doesn't really stack up in any way. To be honest, I'm not quite sure why they wanted to sort of reflect back to the DW8000 because in comparison, it's just nothing. Okay, okay, um, analog filters, you know, and I know I'll get a, get a hammer in for saying it, it doesn't really matter, but actually things are so good now. You look at those sort of 
um, reviews are done of soft tube emulations and the filters are staggeringly good. There's no reason why a digital filter shouldn't be as good on a digi on, as, as good as an analog filter and it'd be really great idea actually if there isn't the performance power on the Raspberry Pi inside this to have 32 voices of polyphony and two layers and all these different things happen it'd be great for Korg to do a DW8000 mode on this uh, and do a really high-end, really quality um, filter emulation and just limit it to what you can do on a DW8000. That'd be, that'd be quite interesting. I think people would be quite interested in having a little, having a little play with that as well. So uh, it's not a DW8000. I think I might have rammed that point home enough. But what it also isn't is a wavetable or a simple wavetable synth and before I go on, I'd like to take just a few seconds to mention Perfect Circuit, who, as I said in the intro, are, are sponsoring this video. I asked for some footage off them, and they sent me this, which absolutely took me aback with that wall of synths. It's fantastic to see a store that actually holds the stock of all these. Let's just go back to that shot. Look at that. It's just so rare to see a place where you can demo so much side by side, which was the original reason for me starting this channel in the first place. If everyone had that sort of stock, I wouldn't have a, I wouldn't be needed. What have we got there? Polybrute, Matrix Brute, Prologue, Hydrosynth, Super 6, a couple of profits. Wow, um, I need to visit Burbank. But do click on the link on the screen or the one in the description and visit the website. They really are great folks to do business with and it's massively appreciated that they're sponsoring this video. So thanks, Perfect Circuit. I love my Microwave XT. I really want to get the Waldorf M. I'm just saving up for it because it's quite an expensive thing. Again, analog filters, they always cost an awful lot more. So for this to stay within this price bracket, it wouldn't be happening with analog filters, would it? But you know, this is so much more than my XT. Okay, there's things the XT, XT can do. It's got the Wave envelope that's got all sorts of different things in the envelope, and this has only got ADSRs. But apart from that, the way it manipulates and plays with the Wave tables is quite brilliant. There's quite a few things we've got in here that you don't have on pretty much anything else. So go back to the initial patch. <laughs> Turn oscillator two down. And we've just got on this, uh, it's a simple wave, there you go. We've got modifiers, you've just seen we've got wave shapers on the effect, and we've got morphing capabilities. So if we go into here, look at the morph. If we double click shift, we get these blue parameters, the secondary parameters. So we've got no, um, no wave or no morph in there. Let's just turn that down a bit. So we've got sync. Windowed sync. Stretch, flip, mirror, mirror stretch, narrow, narrow stretch, windowed mirror, windowed narrowed stretch. <laughs> So we've got loads of stuff on the morphing. We've also got these modifiers. If we go to page one of the wave shapes, you can see which page we're on there on these little, um, little dots. You can see we've got no modifiers on at the minute. Let's put something on. Let's go across to there. Odd only, even only, skip each three, all sorts of different things again. So odd only turns it into a pulse, doesn't it? And we can check that using the analyzer. There we go. Uh, let's go back into there. Uh -huh. Let's go back onto the right thing. Even only. Interesting shape. Vintage 8 and Vintage 12, I like these. Turns it into an 8-bit or a 12-bit sample. You can really hear that on a low end on a sign. So if we go back into the wave shape, let's just see where we are with that one. There's the sign. Hear that? Nice bit of 80s dirt. Twelve bit.
Then we can change the number of steps in that sample if we go back to the analyzer. Back to the waves, that was four steps. This is eight steps. And these are all things that traditional wavetable synths can't do. So it's so much more than my microwave XT. I'm not saying it's better than it in any way. I'm not saying it's better than a, a Waldorf M. I'm just saying it's a different thing. So when it was sort of marketed almost as a DW8000 version 2, where it seemed to be hanging on to that legacy, it's just so much more than that. It's more like um, a hardware serum. I've not played serum that much. My mate had a copy, I've used it a few times, but people have said this is like a hardware serum and I can see why. If you like those sort of tones, you like that sort of manipulation, you wanna do all those sort of things with your tones, you can do it all, well, maybe not all of it, I don't know, um, in this. And also because we've got the, the one-shot samples, it's got that little bit of um, Ensonic ESQ80 about it as well. Uh, so yeah, it's. It, I'm, I'm, <laughs> the more I play with it, the more I'm surprised by it. And one last thing on the wavetables, you can actually load your own. So if you can make your own, you can make them on Serum, can't you? Or you can download thousands of free ones from the internet. You can throw them in this. I've got some in here. Let me just go to the wavetable. I think one was called Talk, Talk, Talk or something. There you go. So this Talk, 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 dot wav, this one's from the internet. <laughs> And just super simple to load, go into the librarian, go into the wavetables, and then just import WAV as wavetable. And just showing that, because it just means it's super, super flexible. You can spend days trawling the internet, getting thousands and thousands of wavetables, and wasting your time going through everything possible. Um, instead of making music, which is what we tend to do some Friday evenings, isn't it? Uh, so it's a really complex wavetable synth. Um, you can play the single uh, samples on it as well, but it's also a virtual analog. So starting off with the initial patch, just turn oscillator two down. So that's a sawtooth. You can load in sawtooths from various synths if you want, but we'll just stick to this basic one for now. And if you look here on the filter types, you've got Poly 6, MS20, and a few others, but let's put it on the MS20. So that sounds to me like an MS20 style filter. I'm not gonna stick it up against my MS20. I don't know if it's gonna sound identical or not, but as a virtual analog, let's give it a bit of envelope. So we can get really nasty, dirty, analog style sounds. I did have an attempt at making an analog style um, pad as well. Go to user. Analog pad. Forgot what type of filter I'm using on that, but it's not the Poly 6. Let's put it on the Poly 6. It's nice, isn't it? I did make another one with a notch. Do like a notch. Let's see if I can find it. These are the ones are made for the uh, for the Robert Miles track. Should you have listened to the thunder actually. <laughs> Bit rubbish, but it did the trick. Um, MS twenty dirty fourth mono. Ah, nice bit of dirt in there. Simple rezo bass. Just ones I've been playing with to see what it does really. Uh, and then a uh, rich analog pad. And I think that's modulating the notch with an LFO.
So again, without going into all the different filter types, we have a Poly 6, MS20 Low Pass, we've got an MS20 High Pass, I think it's non-resonant in there as well, plus we've got all different sorts of 12 dB low pass and high passes and you can mix and match them, you can have them going in parallel so you can blend between them, so loads of things to be done there, but basically um, for this section of this review, it is a virtual analog synth. You can download wavetables that are, or you can download samples of waves, or you can download wavetables of, uh, of analog synths, and you can put them in this as well. So loads of stuff. In fact, let's just see if we can find one. So that's a 35% pulse OB. With a Poly 6 filter on it. Or emulation of a Poly 6 filter. Then maybe let's stick some chorus on it. Let's go for a vintage chorus, shall we? As we're doing vintagey things, vintage chorus. So although it's not marketed as a virtual analog, it can do all those virtual analog things. We've even got FM in here as well. So if we go into, there we go, FM. Let's turn oscillator two up, shall we? We've got AM and ring mod and all those sort of things. So loads of virtual analog bits and bobs you can do on it. Next thing I noticed was that it's really much more flexible in lots of little ways than I first thought it was. So I know I've been going on about how flexible it is already. It's a flexible wave table, it's a virtual analog, it's this, that, and the other. But on things like the envelopes, for example, you can change the curves of the slope. So if we look at the uh, attack curve, for example, let's just put some attack on. We can change the curve of that attack from linear to exponential, and we can do the same with the decay. So yeah, big difference between those. On the LFOs, we've got loads of different LFO shapes. I'm not going to play them all, but triangle, saw up, saw down, square, sign, uh, guitar, exponential up, exponential down, step triggers, step up and down, randoms, <laughs> all sorts of really mad stuff. So there's loads of little extras in here. And one thing I was particularly interested in is this mod process. I've not seen anyone really demo that yet. And this is really interesting. Probably easiest to see this on the editor, actually. I've got LFO1 going into one modulation processor and that's quantizing it. And I'm blending between, or I'm changing between oscillator one and oscillator two with another modulation processor, um, but by modulating that using modulation knob one. <laughs> just, just mad stuff. Then you throw in the chaos pad as well, uh, and all hell can break loose. The next thing I've really got to mention is this editor and librarian, because without it, you could get pretty lost while you're digging through some of the amazing presets that you get with this. Let's just load something in. Let's load a Richard Devine one, because he's pretty good, isn't he, author? Oh, Starsky Carr, who's he? Um, Richard Devine, let's just try one of these. Gorgeous, but what on earth is happening in that? And just like on lots of soft synths now, you can see where the modulation is. You click on this and we can see where the modulation is. So on that cutoff, for example, there's um, the chaos pad, step sequencer A and step, step sequencer B. So sequencer A, sequencer B. Let's put a longer loop on sequencer A. Um, loop start, loop end. Sequencer B, do something similar, loop start, loop end. I should show this in a little bit more detail in a second. Let's just play with these, shall we, and turn the 
sequencer on. Let's do something, see if it makes a difference. Not making any difference. But my point is really that you can see what's happening, so it's absolutely vital when you're trying to dig in to actually learn the synth as well. And if you look at how many different, we showed earlier, how many different performances there are, how many different wavetables, how many different samples there are, it's a lot easier to be flicking through these than it is to be spinning the knob. Because obviously, if you can only see four or five on the screen, whereas on that you can see about 20 or 30, it's just easy to find what you're looking for. But um, it's an absolute godsend and it's great. It comes with it and it's absolutely free. Brilliant. But that does bring us to this motion sequencer and you may well have seen demos of this before. It's a really quite odd sequencer basically. And it's called a motion sequencer and it wasn't until I started playing with it I realized why it's called the motion sequencer and that's because it doesn't re-trigger notes at all. It, you literally hold the note and it just does motions on top of that note. So it's not really, well it is a sequencer but it doesn't sequence notes, it just sequences what's happening to that note and it works on an individual note basis. So if you're holding four notes down, you've got four different sequences running all based on the same thing. Obviously all doing the same thing but at different times. So it just, um, when, it, when I realized it wasn't sequencing the notes, just the actual performance, it all fell into place. But it does sound like it's sequencing notes on lots of things because you've got these envelopes. And these envelopes here, if they're modulating sequence A and sequence A is the volume, you're effectively making something that sounds like it's being re-triggered, but it's not. So, I created this as a little demo. Wobble bass sequence. Although it sounds like it, it's not actually re-triggering notes, it's just playing with a filter. If we come here, we can see the cutoff is modulated by step sequencer A. And these envelopes are what step sequencer A is doing. A lot of people like these things because, or these sort of sequences, because you get those sort of infinite loops and you can have one sequencer lane playing at one length up to 64 steps these can play. You can have another one going backwards and forwards and one playing random notes. You can have different um, notes on or note lengths on each one of the steps. If we look here, each one of these steps can have a different note length. So these are on whatever that is, sixteenths. So you can have them on hugely long ones. And as the sequencer plays through the steps, on the timing, they'll change. They're not changing because they're all looping around this one, but if we change that one, for example, it'll completely and utterly change the track. And as I say, you can have one going backwards, one going forwards. Let's have this going backwards and forwards. I know that's not very musical, but I'm just trying to show exactly what it does without repeating what everyone else has done. But this is the sort of thing I like to do with it. And that's just playing a single note, but the note is changing pitch on sequencer lane two. That's here, and we're changing the shape of the filter that's modulated by sequencer A. So the amount of filter change is determined by the steps on sequence A, and the envelopes are determined by the shape lane. And even with these, we can offset them, change the level, start the phase, and the probability of things happening. So there's absolutely masses of stuff to do in here. All these different sort of envelopes and these weird envelope shapes are good for getting ratchets and stuff like that. So uh, I just thought I'd mention the motion sequencer because I didn't quite understand exactly what it was, but it's when it sort of clicked and it wasn't sequencing notes, it's just sequencing everything else. It can only sequence things that you can change on a per note basis, so it can't sequence mod one, for example, stuff like that, because they're, they're global changes. But um, basically it can, it can change anything, it can modulate anything, really clever bit of kit. 
But there are things that I think maybe could have been done better. As I said earlier, it'd be great to have a DW8000 mode in that and a DW8000 filter. They haven't got a DW8000 filter. Uh, I just think it'd be a bit of fun, really. Um, yes, it could have analog filters. That would, would that make it better? I don't know. As I say, filters are so well uh, emulated now in software that if it takes a lot of processing power, can we just get rid of most of what this can do for that sort of mode? I don't know. Um, it would be nice to see. Uh, but if it did have analog filters, this will cost an awful lot more. So, you know, I know a lot of people say, well, it's a, it's, it's a VST in a box, isn't it? Well, so is any digital synth, there's anything that's digital. It doesn't really stack up to me as an argument that. But um, other things that it could do with is the mod matrix. Although we've got it on the app, and if we look here, we can see that's what's happening with the cutoff. We've got something happening with the amp there as well, have we? Oh no, let's just um, position, no. So on a patch like this, for example, you can see the positions changing. Um, what else is the AB blends? Got, um, got a modulation on it as this. There's that, and that. Oh, that doesn't. The cutoff does. The cutoff's got one, two, three, four, five different modulation routines. So although you can find everything on that, you've got to click on the individual parameters. It'd just be nice for it to have a list down the right hand side showing exactly what was happening so you didn't have to sort of dig around. And again, the same on this, it's just difficult to find what's going on with the modulations. Um, but there are an awful lot of modulations. I'm not sure if there's actually a limit or if you just go on forever. But uh, yeah, so that's a very, very minor niggle. The other thing is that not everything um, that you can access on the editor, you can access on the on the mod wave itself. So there's a few effects parameters, for example, that you get additional on the editor that aren't on the mod wave. It's not a massive thing, you know. It's like really tweaking those delays, which you did for the guitar in that Robert Miles um, re remake. But um, again, it's a really, really minor point. But just because there's so much going on in here, I suppose it's really difficult to get everything with this amount of buttons on it. But all in all, what are my final thoughts? I think the form factor of the Op6, the wave state, and this is really good in that it's portable, it's light, uh, the small, which is great for most people's studios, let's, let's face it. But it, what it also does is it sort of makes it look like not as an impressive synth as it is. If this was bigger and heavier with exactly the same internals, um, it might be taken more seriously. So, you know, yeah, but it might be more expensive, so less people might buy it, I don't know. I suppose it's a play between price, functionality, and form factor, but it just surprised me a lot. A bit like the OP6 did, so I don't know why this has surprised me. I wonder if they'll do a, a software version of this like they did with the OP6. I always call that the OP6 for some reason. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, and if you did, please think about subscribing, join me on Patreon, ring the bell. Also, if you are looking at one of these, do take a look at Perfect Circuit. I've got my affiliate link down below. That'd be really nice, and I'm really, really massively appreciative of them for sponsoring this video. So I will see you next time.